Gout is a form of inflammatory arthritis. Specifically, it's a crystal-induced arthropathy, meaning disease due to crystals being deposited in or around the joints. Specifically, gout is caused by deposition of monosodium urate crystals within tissues, a substance that ultimately comes from metabolism of purines, which are compounds found in the body, for example adenine, guanine and xanthine. Uric acid is the end product of human purine metabolism, but uric acid is a weak acid, therefore in the body where the pH is around 7.4, it takes the form of urate, which is a negative ion, and then binds with the abundant extracellular sodium ions that we have, which are positive, forming monosodium urate. In more acidic environments, like the urine, it remains as uric acid. This is why in gout, the crystals are monosodium urate, while renal stones are more likely to be made of uric acid crystals. Monosodium urate precipitates and forms crystals when certain conditions are met, mostly by having sustained high concentrations of urate, but also local factors like low temperatures, pH, and even the components of cartilage itself. Presence of these crystals within the joint and surrounding tissue is what ultimately gives the symptoms of gout. Hyperuricemia is an excess of uric acid in the blood and is a key factor and the leading cause of gout. Levels above 7 mg per deciliter are considered saturated, which gives the risk of developing symptoms. In males, there is an 800 to 1000 mg pool of urate, while in females, this pool is between 500 and 1000 mg. The causes of hyperuricemia are generally divided into urate overproduction or decreased uric acid secretion. Factors increasing production include eating food rich in purines like meat, seafood, beer and fructose containing beverages and conditions with high cell breakdown or turnover, examples being psoriasis, rhabdomyolysis, tumor lysis, and even lympho or myeloproliferative diseases. Errors in purine metabolism, such as hypoxanthine phosphoribosyl transferase deficiency, can increase the amount of urate. Uric acid is primarily excreted through the kidneys, and to a smaller degree, the gastrointestinal system. So acute kidney injury or chronic kidney disease can lead to reduced excretion, as can hyperparathyroidism and certain substances, like diuretics, aspirin, and even alcohol. Other factors include being male, and in particular, it is rare before the menopause in females, suggesting a hormonal involvement. Increasing age and genetics, which is thought to cause 60% variability in uric acid levels, also increase the risk, as does obesity, and as we already mentioned, comorbidities also play a role in urate levels and the development of gout. Overall, gout is described as a chronic disease that has four main stages. The first being asymptomatic hyperuricemia, although 95% of people with hyperuricemia will not develop gout, and some people with normal uric acid levels can still develop it. In this stage, there can even be the presence of monosodium urate crystals, but they are effectively walled off from interaction with the inflammatory cells by a layer of proteins. However, when this layer is disrupted, the crystals are exposed and are targeted by macrophages and neutrophils, generating an acute inflammatory response. Acute gout attacks can be triggered by local trauma, starting new medications, having an operation or being unwell, and even alcohol binges. There is acute pain most commonly in the first digit metatarsophalangeal joint, that's to say the base of the big toe, that peaks within 24 hours and will usually spontaneously resolve within two weeks. The pain often wakes up the person at night and can feature a red, swollen and very tender joint. This classic presentation on the big toe is known as podagra. It can affect other joints too, including the knee, tala, and ankle joints, and it is thought that the lower limb is more affected due to precipitation of urate into crystals at lower temperatures. Having said that, 
it can affect any joint, including the elbow, and axial joints, including the spine, can be affected, but it's much more commonly found in peripheral joints. Then is the intercritical period, where there may be some lingering pain, but in most cases, the pain resolves while there is still an ongoing subclinical inflammatory process. Chronic tophaceous gout is a stage that frequently occurs after 10 years have passed since the acute attack. Over time, there is granuloma formation around the deposited monosodium urate crystals, clinically found as pale subcutaneous nodules, most commonly on the digits of the hand and feet, but can even happen on the pinna of the ear. These can lead to bone destruction and deforming arthritis. It's also important to note that 75% of people with gout also have metabolic syndrome and are therefore at a higher risk for cardiovascular disease. There's also an increased risk of developing renal stones due to the hyperuricemia. A diagnosis can be made clinically, particularly if the patient is known to have hyperuricemia, meaning no specific tests or imaging are needed. But according to the American College of Rheumatologists, six or more of these features indicate gout. Or the gold standard for diagnosis is analysis of synovial fluid or the TOFI themselves, demonstrating monosodium urate crystals using polarized light microscopy. Monosodium urate crystals are described as needle-shaped negatively biofingent crystals meaning they appear yellow when they are parallel to the red compensator of polarised light, and then blue when perpendicular. This is a common exam question, as pseudogout, which clinically can be similar to gout, but tends to most commonly affect the knee, features depositions of calcium pyrophosphate dihydrate crystals that are rhomboid-shaped and positively biofringent, so have a blue colour when parallel to the red compensator of polarised light, and a yellow colour when perpendicular. Lab markers can show raised inflammatory markers, but these are not specific, and levels of uric acid can be low, normal or high during acute presentations. Therefore, they are more reliably used two weeks after resolution of the symptoms. During acute flares, the aim is to reduce symptoms and inflammation, and longer term to reduce urate levels to reduce the risk of flare-ups and chronic joint destruction. Early treatment within 24 hours can help reduce the severity and the duration, but overall acute flares will be self-limiting within two weeks in most cases. Options include non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen or naproxen, but aspirin is not indicated because it can paradoxically increase serum urate levels by promoting renal retention. Colchicine is another option, as are glucocorticosteroids, which are first line in patients who cannot take non-steroidals or colchicine. Anakinra and canakinumab are anti-interleukin-1 agents that more recently have been shown to have some benefit. Longer term, the aim is to reduce urate levels to reduce the risk of flare-ups and chronic joint destruction. These can include lifestyle measures like reducing the consumption of meat, seafood, alcohol and fructose, and diets like the Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension Diet, which includes high amounts of vegetables, legumes and whole grain wheats. Urate lowering therapy is indicated in cases where there are two or more gout flares per year, chronic kidney disease stage 3 or higher, the presence of TOFI, a history of urolithiasis or chronic gout with TOFI. It's not recommended in asymptomatic hyperuricemia or in people with rare gout flares. Xanthine oxidase inhibitors are first line, like allopurinol, with febuxostat being another option, as these prevent the overall conversion of hypoxanthine and xanthine to uric acid, which is part of the purine metabolism pathway. If these are not tolerated, uricosuric agents like probenicid can be used to increase renal excretion, and uricase is an enzyme that breaks down uric acid that no longer exists in humans, but a recombinant form called pyglotticase is an option in specific cases. 